church. Now, he's not uh, literally telling us we shouldn't ever invite anybody to church, but he is saying we do lean on it as a crutch. And um, I think we need to always remember that being a witness is not directly equivalent to just inviting someone to church. Nor is that really the primary way that we see people being reached, whether that's in the Bible or even today. Where we always see people being reached uh, is, is through personal connections. Now, it's true that God will use sometimes someone coming to a church or coming to an event, but that personal connection is vital. That personal connection is often where, as he said, we're really saying to the person, come and see. And I believe that what people, if, if we were to have people in our lives who, who don't know the Lord, that they're going to see something. They're going to see something about you. Uh, but the question I have is, what will they see? What will they see in us? And I hope, I hope with all my heart, that what people will see when they're around us is the presence of Christ in our lives. So, we're going to look, continuing with what we talked about last week at praying, and we're, we're talking about uh, how we bless every home is the, is the website I told you about. And uh, I want to get us thinking here in uh, Luke chapter 10 about our neighbors, because in that bless every home website, they talk about reaching out to our neighbors I'm going to ask a question that's asked in the Bible. Who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? So Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse, you. I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. Who's our neighbor? Who's our neighbor? Fellow man? Any other answers? Anyone? Okay. Yeah. I think that you're all right, but I think that what's key here is that this is someone that is in the path of this Samaritan man's life. This is, this is someone that has been placed there. So if we're thinking in our own lives, God sovereignly places people in our lives. They're, they're, they're in our path. And I would argue that uh, just like that man there, we, we have to be careful. We don't somehow say, well, that's not real, someone I'm really responsible for. We have to realize that when God places us somewhere, it's for a reason. And uh, we need to think about who are the neighbors that God has placed us in the midst of. And what does it mean to love your neighbor? We've just thought about who our neighbor is, but what does it mean to love them? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. To give? Hmm? Okay. So it involves giving, uh, sacrifice, but it involves giving the way you would, yeah. And um, there's a word actually that, that Jesus used here about the Samaritan. It's a word that, um, that is spoken of Jesus a lot too. It's at the end of verse 33. It says that he, he had compassion. So I would argue that, uh, that true love for our neighbor has to do with seeing the situation they're in and being concerned for their well-being. Right? It's being concerned for the well-being of that person. So two things that you're seeing here, who's my neighbor? It's the people that God places in your path. What does it mean to love them? It's to be concerned for their well-being. So who are our neighbors? We have to ask this question personally. Who, uh, who are the people in my life that are my neighbors? Uh, not just in a general sense, how do I define that, but who are the people that are my neighbors? And I want you to actually start to think about who are the neighbors that God has placed in your life. To help you do this, I'm going to show a graphic here. It's called this Concentric Circles of Concern from a book. And hopefully you can see it pretty well. The first person in the middle there is you. You know who you are. And you know how to take care of yourself. We're pretty good at that, generally speaking. Then we go out to the next circle and we see family. We know that those are people we should be concerned about. And then relatives, the extended family. Friends, people that we know as friends. Then neighbors and associates. And we have these people that are acquaintances. We, we know of them. We kind of know them. But then we get to that person, person X. That would be the person you meet on the plane. The person you meet when you're just somewhere and you have no idea who they really are. But they're all people God has placed along your path, aren't they? In different ways. And they're all people I really believe we have the opportunity to show compassion toward, to be concerned for their well-being. We started with prayer last week. We talked about prayer. Uh, we're going to get in tonight to talking about care. We talked about prayer. We're going to talk tonight about care, how we care for people. And uh, to, to, to get us thinking about the concentric circles, I want to read from Alvin Reed. And Alvin Reed is, a, is an evangelist. He's a Southern Baptist. Uh, he teaches evangelism. And he was up in Manchester, I think, Manchester, New Hampshire, and I unfortunately didn't get to go see him because he's a great writer and a great encouragement to evangelism. He wrote a book that I read recently called uh, Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out, something like that. And the idea is that when we sometimes when we think about sharing our faith, uh, we kind of freak out in some way or we just kind of avoid it. So he's encouraging us. This is something that the everyday Christian can and should do. Now, he asks this, who do you know, who do you know who needs to know Jesus? It's hard to have conversations with lost people when we don't know any, right? You probably know more than you realize. Let's take a look at your current relationships. Many years ago, I read a book called Concentric Circles of Concern. A chart in the book helps us to see those around us with gospel eyes. Take a few minutes to write down the names of people in these circles, okay? So I want you to actually think about this tonight. Later, we're going to have a time of prayer again. And I want you, if you need to write it down, write it down. But he's going to go through here and just get us to think. He says, do you have close family members who need to know Jesus? Other relatives you see on occasion. What about friends? Jesus was critiqued or criticized for being a friend of sinners, not a friend of sin. Do you have friends who are more than evangelism projects, who are real friends who need Jesus? I have a fishing buddy who at, to this point has not come to Christ. I love this friend and I hope he meets Jesus. 
I love what he's saying there. He's saying that we can be friends with people because we truly care about them. All right? Not just simply because we're trying to uh, evangelize, although we need to, but we truly, genuinely are a friend with them. How about your neighbors? Do you actually know your neighbors? And now he's talking about the people in your, na- in your neighborhood you live near. When speaking, I often ask people in the audience to raise their hand if they grew up in a Christian home. It's usually around 80 to 90 percent. I then ask those people to raise their hand if their families ever talked about reaching their unsaved neighbors. It's usually no more than 10 percent. Now, if Christians were to see their neighbors that they live near as, as people that God has placed in their path, how, what kind of impact would that have? We Christian families raise our children as if we were atheists in our neighborhoods. <laughs> Uh, Our neighbors who don't know Jesus are a heartbeat away from eternity without God. I'm not trying to shame you, but to get you to think. Every Christmas, Michelle makes a nice personal Christmas gift for each of our neighbors. She's great with crafts, and we have neighbors who tell us the most precious gift they've received at Christmas is one of her handmade gifts. One year, she painted the home of each neighbor on a clear Christmas ornament, for instance. I would love to tell you all our neighbors now follow Jesus, but that's not real. What I can tell you is that we have seen gospel fruit and God has given us such great relationships with our neighbors as we seek to bring joy to them. What about work associates? I love what he's doing here because he's really getting you to see there's great opportunity. Um, If I say to you, should we evangelize? I think we all say, yeah, we, we need to as a church. But how do we evangelize really gets to this. This is the nuts and bolts. This is who are the people in your life? And your, your associates, do you think about your coworkers? Look at, look at the next circles. Do you have acquaintances? People who aren't necessarily friends, but people you know. Another question I like to ask people is to think about their list of contacts on their phones. So if you have a phone with a contact list, Think about yours. Can you identify at least three people in your contact list who don't know Jesus, but with whom you have enough of a relationship that you can invite them to a meal or to have a cup of coffee and they would join you? The final circle represents person X or the person you don't, you don't know that you may encounter. And, and I talked about that before. I really like that idea where he says to just take your phone list and identify three people. This is very important. Uh, If we're going to obey, we always have to obey in specifics. So you know how this is with kids. We teach kids, you should love others. And uh, we ask them to memorize a verse and we tell them, you know, love others. But where is the challenge for them? It's when they're with that other kid who they don't get along with. It's when they're with their brother or sister, right? And that's where the specific obedience comes in. So if we say, Lord, I want to be a witness, and even if we say, God, save the lost, the only way we're going to be obedient is if we get to specifics. If we say, God, here's a person you've placed in my life, Give me a true heart and open eyes for that person. That's specific. That's saying, yes, evangelism is what we're called to, but here's how I specifically obey. And that is important as we get to step two, because I can talk all I want about caring, but you have to have people that you know God is calling you to care for. You have to know who those people are. So that's why we start with prayer to get us positioned to be asking God to do something. So step one is pray. And then step two is care. And they add uh, in the sheets that I gave you to share, which we will uh, talk about some. So. Does anyone need a sheet tonight if you didn't get one or if you'd like another one? Okay. 
So maybe we could pass these ones out. I don't know if I have. I didn't bring more over there, did I? All right, we'll pass out what we have. And if you need to um, share with others, thank you, Steve. If you need to share with others, that's part of the steps here is to share. So you can share your sheet. While he's doing that, what you'll see on this sheet under prayer is on the left side. And this is all under the acronym BLESS. Our goal, our desire is to see God bring his blessing to the world around us. Abraham was called, and when he was called by God, he said, in, in, in Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. How did that happen? It was through Jesus Christ. That's how all the nations were blessed. And so the blessing of God is ultimately about bringing Christ to the people in this world. So we pray for them, and they give you acronyms here, acronym for prayer, praying for their health, their body, their health, their protection, their strength, for their labor, their work, their financial security, for their emotional situation, for their health and a good quality of life, joy, peace, hope, for their social situation, for their relationships with their family and friends. And ultimately, the foundation of this is spiritual, praying for their salvation that they will come to faith in Jesus Christ, because that's where they're going to experience the true blessing of God. So, Again, this is to get us positioned so that we're beginning to ask God to do something and it gets our eyes on the people that he's placed in, in, in our lives. Getting back to that story of the Samaritan, I really believe it's when we are praying for people and thinking about people that we're stirred to compassion for people just like that Samaritan. Who are you responsible for? The people that God has placed in your life. So that leads us to the care part, to think about who are the people that I can be caring for? And of course, again, it says here, uh, this is now on the right side of the paper, under care, share, B is to begin with prayer. We want to ask, God, how do you want me to bless people in the places you've sent me to? So we've got uh, begin with prayer. All right. Then L. We've already been starting this, this prayer and uh, this prayer time here, and we're going to pray again tonight. But as we continue to do that, then we get to the L. What is L? I'll let you participate. What is L? Listen. Listen. Why is listening important? Yeah. Again, you know, we want God to open our eyes and to fill us with compassion. I mean, Jesus is calling us to love our neighbor. And so we need to know our neighbor. And how do you know someone? By listening. And so it says here, don't talk. <laughs> now that doesn't, you know, not literally, you're allowed to talk. But you know how we can talk and be so concerned about saying things. And this is saying we need to make sure we're listening. Listen to people, their struggles, their pains in the places that God has sent you. What I love about this is, and I want you to make sure you remember this, this is not just something you do, you know, as a, exercise each oh i need to make sure i take you know 20 minutes and listen to someone this is a this is a pattern we're seeking to develop there are all kinds of people in your life you can be listening to right and so listening and asking them good questions because if you want to listen to someone you, you have to sometimes draw things out uh, and i find that if, if you begin to really listen people are willing to talk and, and share if they know that you're really seeking to be understanding. They want to share many times when you generally are concerned for them. So listen. As you listen, you're building relationship. And that's huge because that leads to the next thing we see here, which is what? What? Isn't this a good one? 
All right. Yes. And as Baptists, we're, we have a lot of experience <laughs> uh, with potlucks and preparing food. We like to eat. Now, it says you can't just chuck this off. It's not quick. You have to have a meal with people or a cup of coffee. It builds relationships. So you're building on the relationship you've started, and you do that by eating. And, and as I've pointed out before when I've talked about this kind of thing, eating doesn't just mean literally you have to have dinner. It, it can be dinner, but it could also be coffee with someone. It's that any, whatever really works best for that person in that relationship. The idea when you eat is that that's really just your time to share with someone. And don't take this too rigidly that the key is eating. The key is relationship. So it may actually be a different activity. And that ties in with what that guy was saying. I don't know if you caught that, but he talked about, you know, even, I think he may have mentioned basketball. You know, for some people, that's the natural way that they relate to, to some of the people around them is by doing sports. I've told you this before. Some of the ways I've gotten to know people and, uh, and had opportunities to, to talk with people is golfing because they're stuck with me for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, so you don't have to be eating. That's a great way to build a relationship, but you could be doing activities you both enjoy, Right? So this is part of caring for people, is this reaching out to them with, with activity. Now, you really get into caring when, when you get to this next one, which is what? What's the next one? Serve. Serve. Serving. If you listen with people and you eat with people, they will tell you how to love them. Now, they won't literally say it that way. Uh, here's how you can love me. But if you're listening, you'll know. And you can begin to do the things that are most helpful. What I love about this, too, is, remember, how did the Samaritan know to love that person? The person was there. Yeah, the person was there. We're not talking about um, doing things that are beyond any of our, what, you know, God has given us all our own sphere of influence. He's given us all opportunities. We're limited as humans, aren't we? And so we're not talking here about trying to always do more, more, more. We're talking about doing the little thing that ends up being a big thing, right? Right? It was that one person he saw lying there that needed him. That was big because it was the thing God put in his path. I'm simply saying for us to seek God, God, what's the little thing I can be doing to serve that other person you've placed in my life? Serving takes thought. Uh, so I'm not an expert in this. I'm just getting us to think, what are the ways you can serve people? Can you think of anything? We all have different ways we do it. But what are the ways you might serve people? Okay, taking care of their children. That's a good one. What else? Yeah, getting back to eating. Yeah, and, and by making lunch, you are serving. If, if you're providing it somehow. Yep. Taking, the, yeah, giving rides. That's needed a lot in this area, I've noticed, for a lot of people. Anything else? Yeah, they might not be feeling well and, and you're, you're just there for them. Yeah. Yes. Giving them blankets. Now, you... I. Everybody's different. You, there are some people who make blankets, right? And make things. And you can serve people if you're someone who is uh, gifted in that way and you enjoy it. Wow, what an expression of love to make something for someone. Yes. What? <laughs> yeah. They might need help with uh, something, a job or something like that, and you can help them. Yeah. 
So that's it. And the thing about this, just like I said, your sphere of influence are the people God places in your life. So think about that. The way you serve has to do with how God made you. I get, you know, when I just said about making blankets, that's something I won't do. Uh, well, I shouldn't say never, but it wouldn't necessarily be a good expression of love, right? Uh, <laughs> But I can do the things that God gives me to do, allows me in my own personality and gifting. Now, this is all laying the groundwork for what? And we're going to talk more about this in the future, but the last one is really where we get into sharing, and we will mention it tonight. To share is about our story. It actually, the, the word they use there is story. When the time is right, now we talk and we share the story of how Jesus changed our life. Now I've heard Christians <laughs> go, I've seen Christians, I should say, go to extremes. There are some who say the moment you meet someone, you should just witness. And there are some who say, well, you need to build relationship with them. The problem with that relationship part is how long do you wait? And so I really think what we need to be doing is it's fine to build relationship, but it must be with prayer and with the intent to share. And then I guarantee you, God will begin to give you these opportunities. Uh, and I find that sharing uh, in some ways, can be a process. That's the beauty of when you, when you have the luxury in the inner circles of relationship, you might be talking to a person who they don't even know that there's a God. Can, can I share something too with you? I don't, I don't know if you saw it, but, but when I showed the list a couple weeks ago of the least church states, do you remember we were like tied for 50th? It said that the amount of people in New Hampshire that are, that, are, that are saying, I am sure that God exists, is like 40-something percent. I think it's 43 percent. That means that 57 percent of people in New Hampshire aren't even sure there's a God. So as you're talking to people, you know, you, part of your story may just hit home with them that, oh, wow, huh, I'm going to have to give thought about what you're saying about God. I, I'm not even sure there's a God. And so that's a step for them. because you should. And then the next step might be that they start to not only see, wow, yeah, God is a reality, and I, I'm seeing that. But now that next step, you're sharing about what He has done. Oh, now they're understanding He's a personal God. And then as you, uh, maybe at another time you're sharing about mistakes you've made and you see, well, God is a forgiving God. You see, so you're, you're building up. It's, it's, it's something that can be a process of sharing your story and sharing Christ with them. But it says here, when the time is right, now we talk and we share the story of how Jesus changed our life. And I would encourage you, by the way, to get books like the one I mentioned. And actually, if you want to just start with that one, Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out, that's a good one. Uh, it's, it really is a good book for just to encourage you and very straightforward, you know, just to say, you know, here are the things that you can do that will help you to share your story with, about, uh, to, to share about Jesus with others. Because let's face it, and he kind of meant, he's, a, he's an evangelism teacher, and he knows the danger of overcomplicating it. Uh, because as teachers, uh, we're good at that. Uh, you know, giving you so much information, you're not sure what to do with it all. But he really, you know, boils it down and just helps you to take some simple steps to reaching out. And the truth is, and we'll talk more about this, actually, good segue. Next week, what are we doing? Does anyone know Sunday night what we're doing? Sunday afternoon? That is, that's a great, it fits in great with what we're talking about, right? Making disciples, baptizing them. But then two weeks, uh, I'm, I've invited Pastor Sam Coberly. I've talked about him. So now I'm going to not just talk about him. I'm just going to have him come and talk. And he's going to talk more about sharing Christ with the people uh, in our region, you know, as he's reached out 
I want him to talk about that. But it really is not as complicated as we sometimes make it. And that's what I love about what Alvin Reed says. It, you would be surprised, and I think many of you know this, that people, when God is working, their, their ears become open. Doesn't mean they get saved right away, but God, He provides the open door. And when we just begin to share very simply, but very honestly, God gives us the words and He guides us. And we are a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's keep praying for that, okay? And let's not forget. Oh, by the way, we're going to pray in a, in a moment because what is the key word, not only with these, key word, right? We are developing habits. So, I didn't ask this before. How many of you so far have actually uh, used the website, Bless Every Home? Okay, I, got, see, I heard someone say they looked at it. I see one hand up. You see what I mean? Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't praying for the lost, but we do want to make sure that we're developing habits. And so if you are not in the habit of praying for the lost consistently, specifically. And I would actually say that website is, is going to really help you specifically to pray for your neighbors and to reach out to them systematically. So I really want to just challenge you tonight to make sure that anything we talk about here, you know, but between you and God, that you're, you, you just look at your habits because if we want to see change in our own lives and in our midst, it really comes through our habits. That's really what it boils down to. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but it's worth repeating. When someone wants to get healthy, you know, a lot of times they'll make that push. I've got to really work hard. And you might work really hard, really, really, really hard because you just want to change so badly and be different. But, you know, if you work really hard and you do it for a week and you give up after that, you don't really change. But if you say, you know what, I need a lifestyle change and you just do it week in, week out, a little bit at a time, that's much more life-changing and far-reaching because it's a habit. And so I encourage you, if you'll give yourself to habits that you, I know we all have habits, you know, we brush our teeth every day, I hope. This is more important, isn't it? So let's develop these habits. Let's begin with prayer and then make sure that we care. All right. See, the more time you give me, Joe, the more time I take. <laughs> so, but it was that video's fault. It was him. Now, we still have a little time. So uh, do you have a closing song? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll spend, you know, 10 minutes or so in prayer. Uh, but Joe, when you're ready, you can come up and just start praying, and that'll be kind of a cue if you're not done to, uh, to, to finish, and uh, you can lead us in the closing song. Again, just get with uh, some people of your choice, uh, you know, three to five people. I mean, that's not, doesn't have to be exactly, but that's a good number. Get with people around you, however you want to do it. You, they don't have to be next to you. You can... Walk across the room here if you want. But just get with some people and, and pray. Specifically praying for the people that God has placed in our path. Try to name some names.